My goal with this video is to give an overview of the kinds of question answering data sets that are out there contrast them, and give my opinion about which is the best one. First, let me start off by saying what we're not talking about. There are many question answering data sets that are essentially logic problems or SQL query lookups, and we're not going to talk about them. That's a very valid form of question answering, and it essentially corresponds to a form of parsing where you have some text and you need to turn that into a logical form or an SQL statement. If you parse it correctly, you get the answer. Instead, we're going to talk about more open-ended question answering that's often called machine reading question answering for reasons that will become clear in a second. In these question answering data sets, you need to make sense of a large body of text to answer questions. Moreover, you need to be able to read to answer the questions about just about anything, not just a narrow set of topics. We'll talk about models for answering these questions later. But for the moment, think about the kinds of things that your model would need to do to answer the questions that we'll talk about. Find a document that contains the answer, read through the document to find the answer, and then convey that answer. Okay, back to the data sets. Rather than just listing them off, I'm going to try to organize the data sets based on how much information you have to answer the question and how complicated the answer is. Let's say that we can write this as a two-dimensional plot uh, with provided information as the x-axis and answer complexity as the y-axis. I'll roughly go chronologically through time. In another video, there's an important, completely different dimension. You can think about it uh, as the z-vector coming out of the plane. Who's writing the question and for what purpose? Uh, if you're interested in that, I'll link to that video. Let's start with the most simple example of a question answering data set. You get a question as input and you need to produce a short answer. This is often called factoid question answering. The prototypical example of this is TrekQA. This is a super old school data set, but important to remember as it set the form for everything that came after. The actual data set is tiny, only a couple hundred questions, and the official evaluation process seems impossible by today's standards. You had professional annotators judge whether a system provided the right answer. While every other data set we'll talk about has more automatic evaluations, this is probably the best way to do it at least for some trickier answers. This is our chronologically first question answering data set that we'll talk about, so let's put this onto the board here. One of the first machine reading data sets was the CNN Daily Mail data set from Kamelitz Hermann and Company. Here you have a bunch of news articles. This data set started the trend of conditioning a question on a document, in this case a news article. They asked you to answer questions about those news articles. Uh, for example, who reached the Cricket World Cup? Somewhere in the document was the answer, New Zealand, but you needed to find that. One thing that is controversial is that you didn't actually find the string New Zealand, but rather an anonymized symbol. Because there weren't that many symbols, the task was essentially a multiple choice question. You identified the entities uh, in the paragraph, and then you picked which one was correct. Despite this problem, you can see the influence of this question answering data set on everything else we'll talk about today, particularly on the next big thing, Squad. Before we talk about Squad, uh, let's put CNN Daily Mail on the board. Because uh, the answer space is so constrained, uh, it's down here. The Stanford question answering data set, Squad for short, became the gold standard very quickly for question answering. While it might not be the best data set, it's still the most popular. If you don't report results on Squad, you need to explain why. This 2016 data set helped popularize the modern upsurge of question answering. These questions use paragraphs from Wikipedia and have crowd workers write questions about that paragraph. The questions are intended to have an answer that is a span within the Wikipedia paragraph. One way of thinking about this is that a span is a contiguous set of characters. You highlight that span to give the answer. This is a very large data set, so it doesn't have many of the problems of smaller data sets that we've talked about before. The downside of this is that these crowd workers can often be reverse engineered. There are tricks and cheats that uh, they use to create questions. For example, if a question asks when, 
then all a QA system really has to do is find the thing being asked about and then look for the closest date. In other words, the machine learning algorithms are essentially, again, a multiple choice test. The real reason, in my opinion, that Squad became the gold standard is that it has a very well-trafficked leaderboard where people can submit their systems and to see how they stack up against the rest of the world. Because the answers are spans within the original document, this reduces the task to multiple choice, much like the CNN Daily Mail data set that we talked about before. Thus, it doesn't allow answers that are latent in the text that aren't a fixed span. For example, if the question is, what state shares the Delmarva Peninsula with Maryland? And the Wikipedia page has the Delmarva Peninsula is made up of Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. It can't answer Delaware and Virginia because there's a pesky Maryland there in the middle. One thing that really grinds my gears about Squad is that the Squad dataset provides a human upper bound. And I want to be clear, this isn't the fault of the people who designed Squad. I'm friends with the good folks at Stanford. Uh, but other people have misinterpreted what they meant by human upper bound. And there are less well-informed news organizations or promoters of research that mischaracterize what it means to be near the human bound. They often also mischaracterize what it means to read a document. Even though what we're talking about here in the community is called machine reading, this ain't reading. If machine learning systems are getting close to this human bound, it doesn't mean the computers are reading better than humans and are going to take their jobs or enslave humanity anytime soon. Rather, it means that computers are doing a better job of highlighting particular passages than underpaid, untrained crowd workers. I'll talk more about what I think is a fair competition or comparison between humans and computers in a moment. So putting this on the chart, I'm going to put Squad a little bit above uh, CNN Daily Mail. They're both implicitly multiple choice, but there are more spans and entities, so answering Squad questions is a little bit more challenging. One criticism of Squad questions is that their questions are unnatural. They're written by crowd workers paid to write artificial questions. Two datasets that use real questions are MS Marco and Natural Questions. They're both somewhat similar, so I'll mostly talk about Google's Natural Questions, which is newer, and use that to stand in for both. These questions are harder than Squad and Trek questions. That's because the questions come from real people using uh, a particular search engine. These people don't always know what they're asking about. That's why they're using a search engine, after all. So sometimes they have false assumptions, ambiguities, and other problems with their questions. Another facet of these data sets that make the questions harder is that search engines have trained people over the years to answer questions themselves by finding web pages. And because search engines are good at certain things and bad at others, nobody gets good answers when they type in questions like, what is the last capital in Western Europe to be invaded by a foreign army? So if you type that into Google, you likely won't get a satisfying answer. Instead, you'll piece together multiple queries to answer your question. So you won't find really difficult or challenging questions in Google Natural Questions because search engines like Google have trained us to ask particular kinds of questions that we think it might have a chance of answering. In other words, the failure of search engines to answer questions over the last couple of decades limits the usefulness of the kinds of questions you can get from search engines today. So how does Natural Questions find the answers to these questions? They find a Wikipedia page using the given question as a search string, an information retrieval problem. They then have highly trained, well-paid annotators validate that this is a good search result and then have those same well-trained, well-paid annotators highlight the answer string. This is better than Squad, in my humble opinion, but it isn't perfect. There are some examples where I disagree with some of the implicit assumptions that get made in the NQ dataset. For example, it assumes that when you're asking about Michigan, you're asking about the University of Michigan football team. When you're asking about hockey, you're asking about men's ice hockey. When you're asking about the Supreme Court, you're asking about the Indian Supreme Court. And you can kind of see how this happened. Because 
you have the top one search result coming out of the query that went in, in this case, what Supreme Court judge has served in the National Court of Justice. It pulls up some page about Dalver Bandari, and the raider says, yeah, that looks good. It answers the question. But maybe there are other things that answer these questions. So for example, Michigan State won the women's cross country tournament in 2014. The hockey question is assuming men's ice hockey. But the US women's team has won ice hockey more recently, and this totally uh, forgets about field hockey, which is also an Olympic sport. Kotaro Tanaka is also a Supreme Court judge who later was on the International Court of Justice. Uh, and arguably, in my opinion, had a more prominent role in world history. And this data set is assuming that some things are more important than others, and we're propagating these biases in later systems that will train on data sets like natural questions. And this, I think, is something that, that we should look out for. As we put these data sets up on the chart, I want to make a distinction between the traditional and open interpretations of natural questions. While initially natural questions was treated like a squad-like data set, where you condition the answer on having a particular Wikipedia page, recent interpretations haven't stuck with that assumption, and you need to actually find the correct Wikipedia page yourself. In other words, you need to do the information retrieval component as well. This addresses some of these issues here. Uh, even though the official answer makes these assumptions, systems are free to explore to find alternate interpretations of these ambiguous questions. Uh, this is what we did in the efficient question answering competition at NeurIPS 2020. Uh, Check the link if you want to see the video, uh, and you can also see how I made natural questions into a fairer uh, human versus computer competition. Obviously, the open interpretation makes it a little harder to find the answer. You know who's better than underpaid crowd workers or random people on the internet to write your questions? Professional trivia writers. And a number of datasets use questions harvested from them. I'll mention three of them right now, Search QA, Trivia QA, and Quiz Bowl. Search QA and Trivia QA actually look a lot like natural questions. It's just that their questions are coming from professional trivia writers rather than random people on the internet. Uh, researchers went out uh, and find web pages that could uh, answer the query, highlight the answers in those pages. I'm not going to dwell too much on these data sets because the copyright here is a little murky. And I also want to talk about my favorite format, uh, Quiz Bowl. This is probably better known as an NBC game show in the US called College Bowl or University Challenge in the United Kingdom. And even when it's not on television, it's played by thousands of trivia nerds every weekend, particularly at the high school and college level. And unlike Search QA and Trivia QA, there's an explicit community consensus that old Quiz Bowl questions are in the public domain. Students should use them to study. So as a result, we get a lot of free data from experts that's updated annually. These are not crowd workers. These are people who are passionate about human question answering and we're using their expertise and their experience to improve computer question answering. This has become the gold standard in human question answering, i.e. trivia tournaments, and uh, my goal is to make it more popular than it currently is for computer question answering. What's different about Quiz Bowl is that there isn't just one question that you need to answer. Instead, there are multiple clues that you could use to answer the question, and they're ordered in a special way. This is hard to explain, and it's a lot easier to see with an example. So as I read this question, think about when you know the answer to the question. What clue gave it away, and what's the earliest point when you could have answered? While passing through this state, the 6th Massachusetts suffered the first Union casualties of the Civil War while suppressing riots that began at its President Street station. The Lincoln administration rejected a ruling by Roger Taney that a citizen of the state could not be held without habeas corpus in the ex parte Merriman decision. After capturing a copy of Robert E. Lee's Special Order 191, 
George McClellan fought a battle in the state that ended the first Confederate invasion of the North and led to the announcement of the Emancipation Proclamation. For 10 points, the Battle of Antietam was fought in what border state where federal troops blocked secessionist efforts in Baltimore? The clues are presented one by one, going from super hard to pretty easy. Until someone can answer the question. With the answer, the great state of Maryland. But because this is a competition, whoever can answer the question faster, on the harder clues up top, usually knows more about the topic. Because this is a trivia game, the goal is to give more points to the smarter player. Quiz Bowl does this really well, better than some other fun to watch knowledge competitions. Again, in my opinion. One downside to Quiz Bowl is that sometimes the ordering of clues doesn't line up for what's difficult for a computer. And just like Squad, sometimes there are easily solved questions that are intended to be difficult for humans but aren't difficult for computers. For example, in one of our competitions that we had with humans, a computer easily recognizes a painting from a description. This object appears in the back right of a painting that shows five workers moving grain around a water mill. This object is rendered in bright red and beneath a light smattering of clouds in the painting south wind clear sky. This object... 36 views of Mount Fuji. That is correct. Okay, it's just Mount it's good thing. Okay, and lest I be guilty of the same thing that I complained about with people talking about squad, I'm not saying that these systems have a deep understanding of hokuzai or an appreciation of Japanese art. It found a phrasing in Wikipedia that sounded a lot like the question and was able to match it up. And the question wasn't well constructed to be sequenced in the correct difficulty for a computer. But some things that are easy for humans to understand are actually kind of tricky for a computer. The main character of a story by this author opens Crime and Punishment to a random page, but finds it to be a copy of the Brothers Karamazov and equates himself with Monsieur Bovary. This author wrote a story in which the priest Negu undergoes a boiling treatment to tre decrease the size of his nose. I could yell. Ten points. The computer answers at that point with Fyodor Dostoevsky. You didn't hear the answer for technical reasons. If you're curious about why, check out the whole video. The computer gets it wrong because when it sees the phrase, this author opens crime and punishment, it thinks that the answer is Dostoevsky, but it doesn't realize that it's embedded in a larger phrase. This is obvious to humans, and even if you can't recognize that the answer is a Kutagawa, you can tell that it sure isn't Dostoevsky. This is one of the ways that we're trying to make Quizwell better. Uh, this question was generated with human in the loop adversarial generation that you can learn more about in the linked video or paper. As you can tell from these clips, one of the reasons that I'm a big fan of this format is that it lends itself to human computer comparisons. Let's say that you have two competitors, A and B. What if we try to compare them on normal questions like from natural questions? If both get the question right or wrong, then you don't learn anything. You only learn something when one gets it right and the other gets it wrong. Human question writers learned really early on that it's pretty difficult to get the right level of difficulty. Even with fancy statistics, you need hundreds of questions to reliably rank people in competitive exams. Because the questions are packed to the gills with clues that go from super difficult to almost painfully easy, after each clue you get information about how much A and B knows. Thus, it lends itself to human-computer competition or comparing computer systems. But this difficulty of the prompt means that it is way over out on the far edges of uh, the chart. The question input is much more difficult and the format of going word by word is pretty annoying. And that's probably why it's not very popular in the natural language processing community. But nonetheless, I like it. Uh, and another reason that I like it is that there are multiple ways that you can answer these questions. You can view it as a straight information retrieval task because many of the questions are just entities. And so you can find the Wikipedia page associated with an entity, give that page title as the answer. And oftentimes 
that's a good way of answering these questions. And so, for example, in an undergraduate class, you can build a pretty good system that answers these questions uh, with pretty simple methodology. But you could also apply all of the exciting and cutting edge open domain machine reading systems that, for example, you can also develop and train on natural questions. That's enough about Quiz Bowl. If you subscribe to this channel, you can hear about it more often. And you can also see all the new matches between humans and computers that I played short little clips of. Before we wrap up, I want to talk about some of the other kinds of data sets that are out there really quickly. I, I won't discuss them in detail, uh, and I won't talk about all of the QA data sets out there. There are just too many these days. But if any of these sound interesting to you, or I've left out a favorite, put a link in the comments. So first, Quack. Question answering in context. This data set is about conversational question answering. As a result, many of the questions depend on co-reference or other ambiguities. We created a version called Canard that tries to remove those ambiguities to make the question format difficulty a little bit lower, so to move it closer to the origin on the chart that I was showing you just a second ago. And we also have a QB-Link data set that does something similar with Quiz Bowl questions. Narrative QA is a great data set, but it's not as popular as it should be because it's just too darn hard at the moment. Instead of answering questions about Wikipedia documents, you have a script of some interaction, like a scene from a play or a movie, and you need to answer a question about what happened in the story. It doesn't lend itself to the machine reading approaches that work for other data sets, uh, but it's really interesting. Hot Pot QA requires you to string together multiple pieces of information to answer a question. This is implicit in a lot of Quiz Bowl questions, but Hot Pot QA does it better because it explicitly annotates the logical jumps you need to make to answer a question. The authors of Hot Pot QA got authors to explicitly mark what the answer is and the internal links in each of these questions. Also, there are whole types of question answering that I haven't talked about at all. What about non-English data sets? There are a few, but not enough. Uh, what about answering questions about pictures? That's a whole uh, subgenre within question answering, and there are data sets for those, but this video is already long enough as it is. So I should probably wrap up for now. Question answering is a really exciting field right now. There's so much energy both from people building data sets and models. And despite my enthusiasm for Quiz Bowl, I also recognize that it's not the perfect format. There is no perfect format. But because machine learning data sets need training data to improve before we can create machines that can answer any question, we first need to create data sets that will teach the machines the right mechanism for answering questions. And because there is no perfect data set, we need to learn from the imperfections of existing data sets to learn how to make it better and to get what we can from the data sets we do have. If you want to see more videos like this, check the video description for the course that comes from the link down below. You can then see the context and the correct order for watching these videos. YouTube will gleefully show you stuff in the wrong order. If you want other people to see this video, provide a big gradient to the recommendation algorithm by clicking the like and subscribe button down below.